everyone who needs to, because most of the program, uh, in the at least in the first part, uh, in the morning session, will be mostly in Polish. If you need to switch to English, uh, exactly. Follow Deborah. <laughs> she's, <laughs> she's now fixing her set. The same option is available uh, in, uh, uh, in the Zoom setting online. So by all means, uh, feel free to use it. Uh, immediately, a big thank you to our interpreters. Thank you for being with us and thank you for supporting us today. We really appreciate it. So very briefly in Polish, before I start an official opening address, uh, you can use the publication sets, uh, translation sets, and there are there is an interpreter's team who is going to guide us through various language versions. Today, the conference is bilingual, so you can communicate both in Polish and in English. This is point number one. So officially, let me open the conference. My name is Maria Drabczyk, and I have the pleasure to um, preside the advocacy policy in the Digital Center. So uh, we are going to discuss very important issues today. This is the beautiful area of the Aguilonian Library, but uh, we are also online. We are really happy to see so many of you uh, here in the room, and we are even slightly intimidated by the number of our listeners online. It's more than 500 people who registered. This is a clear sign that the subject is by all means uh, important. And I do hope that the form of this conference is going to be a dialogue. That is why I hope that it's not going to be an ex cathedra lecture but we would like you to enter into a dialogue with us, also those who listen us to us online. The conference is being recorded and all the sessions will be available online. You may also return to the issues that are of special interest for you. One more thing. Was there are some of the vouchers uh, well, we are short of vouchers, but now they are back. We have more vouchers, so you can collect them at the reception. Uh, so something concerning the subject, if you follow our activity in the center, you will surely know that the issue of the accessibility and openness and also vision and mission uh, especially in the public sector, are of great importance for us today, especially in the context of libraries and archives, and also in the context that are going on with regards to um, the uh, law of the EU and also that everything that translates into Polish legislation. We are going to talk about this in a very specific context. So how this uh, law um, supports the missions of libraries. We are going to do it in a great uh, group of experts. We are very happy that they all accepted our invitations. I'm really happy to uh, be um, experiencing the, the exchange of your reflections and experience. Please join in whether you have questions or comments. Uh, also, there will be a moment in the today's program in which we are going to discuss our new research concerning secure digital lending. It is an important issue for us, digital environment and the pursuit of the library's mission in this particular dimension. That is why I would like to invite you to the second panel. And also very, very briefly, because I would like to pass microphone further, the, today's event would not be possible without pa uh, partners, you know, without Knowledge Rights 21 program, which made it possible to carry out this um, event. We are the local coordinator, uh, so I'm not going to steal the story of the uh, 
of Victor, but also we are also here thanks to the uh, collaboration with the Faculty of Law and Administration. Mr. Dean, thank you very much, and Future Lab. And also, we are also grateful for the collaboration with the Jagiellonian Library. Uh, we, I would like to thank for the patronage of the Jagiellonian Library. And now I would like to ask the Dean to say a few words for the opening of the conference. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the authorities of the Faculty of Law and Administration of the Gelonian uh, University, I would like to welcome you at a conference that is organized in collaboration with our faculty, especially with the Chair of Copyright and Property Law. Uh, the representatives of our faculty are going to have presentations and contributions. New technologies uh, always evoke many issues and problems of legal nature. For example, during pandemic, we uh, experienced the problem with the access to libraries, resources, and publications, and also the use of digital versions, paper publications, reproduction, and also permissible use. Uh, and fair use. Uh, this is also the issue of the uh, access to the to culture, anything that is protected by copyright. And the question is how it should be protected. These are by all means great challenges. Also, when it comes to the new uh, form of digitalizing, how to digitalize uh, various publications, it is a technical problem because we would like to have the access to the works uh, because some of them exist only in an electronic version. So perhaps technology will change and in 10 years time, everything uh, will be recorded in various forms. But what about the access? Another thing is the protection of personal data, the access to all documents, which may be um, uh, available to the public because they should be accessible for research, for science, but it's all at the dangers of various threats and attacks. And also the risk of destruction is larger because the access from any place in the world is possible. So I do hope that this conference will help us to work um, out some solutions and conclusions. And perhaps in future, we will find the correct balance between the need for the protection of the interest of an author and also the protection of the entire community and in the access to the works of culture. So I would like to wish you an interesting debate. Thank you very much, Mr. Dean and Director, the floor is yours. Uh, this is Mr. Remy Gursapa, the director of the Jagiellonian Library. Ladies and gentlemen, we are really glad that such talks can be carried out here because on everyday basis we struggle or rather face a lot of dilemma related to the operation of library in the light of new legislation and in new technical conditions, which force us to think what we can do, what we should do, and what's even more, which path should be followed, which path should be invested in, especially given the limited number of resources. So something that might happen in six months might be a disaster for the development of the library. So the news is that we are going to face even greater challenges because the technology, artificial intelligence are developing fast. And also this term has a marketing dimension because everything is described as artificial intelligence. But still, a lot of things are going on in this area in libraries, in archival, archival information. And this is multifactorial. We don't know where we will reach in a couple of years, the engineers who are working on artificial intelligence. And I had a 
returns to carry out a longer conversation in a person who is responsible for such issue. So they don't know where they will reach, but they also, they do not know where they are going now. So this is even more frightening. So for us, it is like about snow and cleaning the streets. So if you need to remove snow from the streets, the snow needs to fall. But what about transitional moment when the snow has already fallen, but nobody has cleaned the streets yet? So uh, this is a dangerous moment. So the issue concerns that our reaction. So we are waiting for solutions about which we do have some intuitive anticipation, something this will progress within the next years, but we need to wait until this happens and in response to something happens in technologies, the legal regulations will follow and we need to go on working. We cannot close the library and wait for the next five years to see what the engineers and lawyers um, create. Certainly engineers first lawyers will follow because it's difficult to regulate something that does not exist. We still need to regulate these issues and function in the way that does not lead us into cool design. So we need to talk about these issues, share our experience, share our dilemmas, because thanks to that, the use of our common ideas common experience and conclusions will have to will help us to face the future so once again i would like to welcome you uh, in the agilonian library wishing you a successful debate thank you very much and eva the floor is yours this conference would not be possible without our uh, collaboration with the future law lab So let me join in to what has already been said by the previous speakers. So I would like to tell you shortly about what Future Law Lab is. It is a virtual platform which helps us to bring together those who have who carry out academic research in law, who have academic research in other areas and who have a different perspective of law, how it is executed, what the weak points are and how this can be amended in future. That is why I'm really happy to, um, uh, to listen to the contribution of the director of the Agelanian Library and also the perspective of the dean who said uh, how law should be changing in future. And this will show us what Future Lab is and what it will be in collaboration with the units from outside university, from the social and economic surroundings and for this, I would like to thank Maria Krawczyk and Katarzyna Strychasz and Dr. Konrad Piersiński for the great inspiration for collaboration and for the organization of uh, this conference. So I would like to wish you an inspiring debate and I would like to give the floor over to the next speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you. We really hope that this is just the beginning, the first of all the meetings that will continue. And now, last but not least, the person that created this uh, event, because we are here under the umbrella of Norwich Lights 21, uh, the issue that is very important for us and opens a new collaborations for us. So knowledge, mm, 21 to anyone. And I would like to ask Mr. Stephen Weber. Weber. So uh, uh, Stephen is the director of the policy of advocacy of the World Federation of Libraries. And also he's one of the mm, uh, founders of Knowledge Rights to Anyone. I'm going to speak a little bit in Polish so you can evaluate my command of Polish. So I'm really happy that you are present here. And also I would like to thank the 
Digital Center for inviting me. So also, I would like to thank you for patience and tolerance for my Polish. Uh, it, it was a difficult invitation because 21 years ago, I lived in Żywiec, which was a small town. So Krakow was the way to escape for me. But it is also because the Digital Center organized this event in collaboration with the Aguilonian University. I work for library organizations dealing with advocacy, which is one of my key tasks, which is to uh, look after librarians so that they could see their own potential as advocates. This happens because there is a great amount of practical experience in the field, in the sphere that defines how to uh, render a valuable and process information. It is too easy to look at these legislation and be a pessimist, assuming that nothing will change. But this is not this what the situation should look like. I am the person uh, that whose task is to pursue the fundamental mission of public interest as a librarian, as an archivist. So if you uh, uh, experience frustration, it is not that you are mistaken. And this leads me to another key element of my mission, looking after the stakeholders who should perceive the library as their allies and friends, as those who will support them, as something were uh, following. And it is also great to see the librarians here and also the uh, entire environment of librarians. So I would like to thank Maya, Conrad and Kasia and the entire team. This event is carried out in the context of the collaboration of uh, with Knowledge Rights 21 and IFLA, my own organization is one of its partners. I will discuss it later on in detail, but one of the main objectives of the program is that the contribution, that the voice of libraries will be listened to and followed and that their experience will be treated seriously and their needs will be included into the political debate. We would like the librarians to be an active and involved parts of the movements for political framework that supports the right for research, education and culture in the 21st century, supporting, su uh, supplying uh, evidence, and so on. At the moment where the distribution of digital tools gives us more control than any at, at any moment before. So for the collaboration, how students and teachers could use information, we need to be active and we need to look at the details of policy. And we would like to have the possibilities of guiding the approach to research, education and culture, which is driven by future. So we should establish what kind of libraries and museums and archives we would like to have in future so that we should have the policies that are available. This is the task which is carried out in Poland by the Digital Center. And I'm also happy that many of our coordinators are present here. So they uh, guide the efforts in their own countries and who collaborate on the inclusion of the opinions and voices of libraries into ongoing political debate so that they could be working on it in future. Through their own work, they enlarge their knowledge, they create precedences and work on the possibilities of helping the development of debate here in Poland and uh, about what we communicate to our countries. That is why, instead of occupying more time, I would like to thank the digital uh, archives and uh, I'm waiting for the presentations, questions and comments. Thank you very much.
participate. Thank you very much. Well, ladies and gentlemen, let us start. to the stage. Katarina is an associate professor of corporate private law at Santa Anna School of Advanced Studies in Pisa, Italy. Uh, she's also a, and this is how we met, uh, she is, or she just finished a uh, EU European project, um, recreating Europe on exactly rethinking digital copyright law for a culturally diverse, accessible and creative Europe. So we thought we couldn't ask for a better introduction for our discussions. So uh, without further ado, uh, I would say the floor is yours. Thank you for being with us. Yes, I am. I just don't want <clears throat> Okay, one, one. I will just maybe check. Is the translation working for everyone? Czy tłumaczenie działa dla wszystkich państwa? Super. Thanks a lot, Maya. Can you hear me? Because I can't hear myself too well, so. <laughs> okay, thank you very much really for this invitation. I am deeply honored for, to be here with you today and to have this possibility to actually bring once again further the findings of this research project I had the honor to coordinate. And I'm glad to be able to contribute also with the policy recommendation for uh, galleries, libraries, archives, and museums we uh, we developed. The project Recreate in Europe, in fact, just finished. We had uh, like to share both the findings and uh, uh, policy recommendations uh, in Brussels with policymakers and people engaging uh, in copyright. But when I received this invitation, I thought that particularly having a look at all the other speakers and the content you are going to, to bring forward, that probably my role was to give you a framework on, uh, in which to operate afterwards without boring you too much with details on those parts of our research that are not necessarily relevant for the topic we discussed today. So what I'm going to do in the next 30 to 35 minutes, luckily there is a watch there because as an Italian, and I look at you, you know, Italians, it's true, they tend to speak too much. So right. having, a, having someone who tells me when it's time to stop is, is absolutely very welcome. Otherwise, I can entertain you until this evening. So that's going to be the structure of my talk. I will start by laying the groundwork of what the conflict and interest uh, are here at stake. So copyright versus the right to culture. See where these rights are framed in the EU, uh, in the EU legislation and constitutional sources. And then I will move from there, so to see what the, uh, what the framework tells us that the balance should be, to see what the balance is actually looking in practice. So I will give you some snapshots of the finding of a mapping we conducted in the past three years on copyright flexibilities in EU with a particular focus on cultural rights and cultural uses. Uh, this will be a twofold assessment because first I'll show you what was going on before the big reforms we had in the past years, and then I will assess what the copyright in the digital single market directive actually did to advance some of the goals we will uh, discuss today. This will be done by looking at the divergences in implementation in different member states and by also looking at first impact assessment, uh, sort of, um, not impact, but assessment of the opportunities that member states lost in, uh, were by, that were given by the CDSM directive. And we will conclude with some policy recommendations on where should we go in the future. You will see that I won't just refer to cultural uses, but to all those flexibilities that might play a role uh, for cultural access, preservation, and democratic participation and access to culture. So let me start from uh, the very beginning. This is a debate that has been going on now for a while. Legal scholarship in Europe has been particularly active in this. One of my first article on the topic dates back to 2010, so it's not really yesterday, which on the one hand tells you that there is a lot that we researched about, on the other, it tells you that 12 years were still not enough to bring this to the policy stage in an effective manner. 
Now, when we discuss about copyright versus the right to culture, we take into account the fact that copyright covers literary, artistic, and musical works, which represent, at the end, the very core of what cultural heritage represents for all of us. So you have on the one hand this right, which is considered to be a property right, but most, but by most of uh, um, the member states. And on the other hand, you have a plethora of public interest and private interest conflicting with it. The public interest in preservation and access to cultural and artistic heritage and private interest in rights, like the right to take part in cultural life, the right to education, the right slash freedom to research and freedom to, of expression broadly intended, which is the right to receive and impart information that is part also of the right to culture. On top of this, you have the right of artistic and scientific freedom and also to produce derivative works. The way how um, copyright clash with those rights is because, of course, reproduction, the right to reproduction, the right to distribution, the right to communication to the public and the lending right impacts on your possibility to do private study, to exercise your right of education, to do research, to engage with democratic access to cultural and creative products and cultural heritage, to engage in a democratic participation in the cultural life of the community, to have a diversity in the cultural heritage that is both preserved and at the end also made available because to preserve is not enough, and preservation broadly intended is what we conclude our overview with. We have already a number of balancing tools. It's not that this, this need for a balance was not uh, realized at the first place. We have limitation in terms of time to copyright. It expires after a certain while. Certain subject matter are excluded from protection, so they are part of the public domain. We have also paying public domain, so we give some money to um, right holders in order to have, to have former right holders in order to stick, still keep on financing them and making uh, the public domain rich. We have a number of limitations and exceptions, and we have statutory licenses, so schemes that are uh, implemented to ensure that the right to remuneration of authors and performers still is respected while we keep on having access without authorization. The main problem we have is that the so-called right to culture is not really present in most of our national constitutions. So we have cultural rights, but they are only indirectly part of our national constitutions. And most importantly, you don't have a reference to cultural rights and the related, related clashes you may have in the international treaties and conventions on copyright. Set aside the Marrakesh Treaty about access to culture for, and so um, cultural products for visually impaired individual, you don't really have international copyright conventions and treaties that refers to the right to culture as something to be taken into account in the balance. The only real reference we have out there to this mismatch is the convention, the United Nations Convention for uh, uh, Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, that is a binding uh, sources in Article 15 that talks about the right to take part in cultural life. And the general comments that were, we will have a look at them in a second, address the interpretation of this provision, mention the fact that there is a dangerous interplay between copyright and participation in cultural life. So member states of the convention should take into account the need for a balance. This is a binding source for all member states of, of the international convention, which are basically almost all the member states of uh, the United Nations. Just let me know if I'm speaking too quickly for the translation, okay? Because sometimes I tend to accelerate. Just give me a sign if I'm speaking too fast and you can't do uh, direct translation. Now, in fact, Already in Article 27 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which is not directly binding, but is part of uh, customary sources of international public law, you have a reference to the right that, that everyone has to freely uh, participate in the cultural life of the community, to enjoy the arts, and to share in the scientific advancement and its benefits. 
And it's very interesting to see that in the very same article, you have at the same time participation and access to cultural life and the right to the protection of the moral and material interest resulting from any scientific, literary, or artistic production of which the person is the author. Like if this protection of what looks to be IP, intellectual property, but is not, would be the other side of the coin of participating and accessing to cultural life. And you have several other references to this right, uh, which I report here just for your perusal, but slides will be circulated afterwards, so don't lose your eyes now to have a look at them. The right to take part in cultural life is not present in the European Convention on Human Rights, but recent case law of the Strasbourg Court made reference to it in the balance with copyright. And the only reference we have in the European constitution, if you allow me calling it in this way, the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union, doesn't mention them, but just in Article 13, freedom of arts and science. And it says that the arts and science research shall be free of constraints and academic freedom should be respected. You have the very same references, either under freedom of expression and under freedom of arts in several national constitutions but no reference to cultural rights whatsoever. They are a sort of Cinderella of social and economic and cultural rights. If you look at this famous Article 15 I showed you before, what they did in 1979 was to take the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and to split in three parts this right. So the state parties to the covenant should recognize the right of everyone to first, take part in cultural life. Second, to enjoy the benefits of scientific progress and its application. So you have culture and science together. So this has been called the right to science and culture by US scholars. And then at the end, you once again have the second, the other side of the coin, the protection of the moral and material interest of the creator, as if it will be a precondition also to participate in cultural life. If you look, and here I try to go a bit faster, the general comment to this provision tells us by having a look at the at letter C, which is about the moral and material interest of the creators, is that the sprung of Article 15 are mutually reinforcing and reciprocally limitative. So the right to take part in cultural life and to enjoy the benefit of science limit and reinforce at the same time the right to have, to have the moral and material interest of the creator protected. But the most important thing that this provision tells us is that those moral and material interests are those that are protected as human rights, not intellectual property. So intellectual property is not protected as a human right as we know it, but just this human right core is protected as such. And the clashes between these human rights should be solved. Why? Because intellectual property is a social product and has a social function. So it should be functionalized to social goals. At least this on paper. What are the obligations that member states have uh, stemming from this article? And they need to report every number of years. So it's not just something that is on paper. They need to protect the right of everyone to engage in one's own cultural practices and to seek and develop cultural knowledge and expression and to share them with others, as well as to act creatively and take part in creative activities. But they should also have access because there is no such a thing as participation if you don't have access. And what is the access to cultural life? Is the right of everyone to know and understand his or her own culture and that of others through education and information, and to benefit from the cultural heritage and the creation of other individuals and communities. So that's what member states of this covenant would need to do. Now, this has a number of impact because human rights lawyers usually say that you have from, member states have from these obligations actually three different types of obligation, to respect the rights of individuals, to protect these rights vis-a-vis -vis third parties and to fulfill, so to proactively engage in uh, um, policies that fund, that sustain, that make these rights advance. So these are the three obligations that member states have. Respect 
or towards private state to private, private against private, balancing, and active fulfillment. Of course, copyright clash with access and participation. It clashes because it privatizes cultural goods. It controls reproduction, performance, and communication to the public of this culture. In terms of law, once again, it, you have an increased control over raw information and data. Think about database rights and the expansion of copyright scope. And also owners can privately control more and more cultural and creative goods with digitization. So by digitally controlling beyond what copyright gives them as a right, what you do with their works, and then you have a contractual expansion of their rights. And this may impact access to this material that has, of course, an impact on participation, because to participate in cultural life, you need to have access to cultural materials. And when you yourself create, you may infringe others' copyright. This got blocked. So what we did in the past three years in uh, the Recreating Europe project, at least in the um, Santana's team in PISA, was to map the EU copyright key, national copyright laws on EU member states and private regulatory sources. So actually contract law and user license agreement having an impact on what we called copyright flexibilities. We introduced this terminology to indicate not just what you, if you are mm, familiar with copyright, know as exceptions and limitations. We didn't just cover exceptions and limitations, but we covered all regulatory tools that may balance copyright with conflicting rights and interest. So we covered also exhaustion, we covered terms of protection, public domain, statutory licensing, fair balance, the three-step test, and several other types of non-infringing uses. And we did it because we realized that out there in the doctrine, there were no single attempt to do this comprehensive mapping in all member states by having a look not only at uh, statutes available, but also case law and regulation. So what we did in three years was first to start with data collection via desk research and by administering semi-structured questionnaire to national experts, some of them are in this room and I keep on being thankful to them for to the moon and back. And we uh, actually, uh, because they also did it for free, by the way, out of their own passion. And uh, we made two different rounds of questionnaires in December 2020 and in March 2022 to grasp what was before and after the CDSM directive. This produced 27 national reports on the state of copyright flexibilities in all member states and 10 comparative reports on specific uses that win against copyright. You will see what I'm referring to in a moment. The final product of these are basically two key outputs. One is a 600, six, uh, six, 667 more or less pages report. You can freely download online and a website www.copyrightflexibilities.eu that gives you real-time access to all the sources we mapped translated into English with also data visualization which we are still fighting to get uh, in terms of data analysis objective enough in terms of methodology. We also came up with best practices for stakeholders and policy recommendations. Of course what I'm going to do with you it's not to uh, give you all the general conclusions we ended up uh, formulating because I would like to interact with you in the in at least 10 minutes of Q&A. So I will just focus uh, on really the general framework and then cultural uses. We ended up concluding at the EU and national level that we actually keep on having an extreme fragmentation and clusterization of these flexibilities. So they are very much separated in users and they don't interact with each other and they are really conceptually separated, which makes it very difficult for in the implementation to use one instead of another one when you have legislative gaps. Most of them are outdated because technology runs much faster than the law and we have several multiple regimes around, mandatory, optional and whatever, which hampers legal certainty. The Court of Justice of the European Union helped us a bit with the horizontal effect of fundamental rights. So they clarified certain provisions, they made them more flexible, 
but we are still very much away from a pure harmonization. At the national level, we realize that there is a full reception of directive and regulations. So there is a convergence between member states, but just in certain areas and not in others. So certain optional exceptions, unfortunately, mostly regarding cultural heritage preservation and access were not implemented by all member states. But the most problematic thing we noticed is that the doctrines, the principles of the Court of Justice of the European Union were not really followed adequately by member states. So several member states simply disregard the principles brought forward by the Court of Justice, which actually hampers harmonization. And this is mostly the case about preservation and parody. What we did, what I can show you in terms of wrap up of the national solutions to balance copyright with cultural heritage and the right to take part in cultural life before the Information Society Directive in 2001 was that we had something out there, but that's what remained. We had lending and reprography exceptions on collection within specific limits. You can see the small acronym of the state there. We got an exception for the exhibition of works of art in museums, an exception for reproduction, for preservation and exhibitions, are very scattered in terms of works covered and, uh, and beneficiaries, and an exception for reproduction for simultaneous public lending. What uh, happened after 2001, as you may know, is that the InfoSoc Directive introduced in Europe a number of exceptions for cultural preservation. An exception to the right of reproduction uh, for, for publicly accessible libraries, educational establishments or museums or by archives for nonprofit, and an exception to the rights of reproduction and communication making available to the public for use of works in public places and for uh, galleries, libraries, archives, and museums to make available their collection on dedicated terminals. This is what we had. You would say, well, that's a good step forward. But actually, uh, if you have a look, and uh, I try to uh, run a bit to give you a sense of what I'm talking about, our mapping showed that in the cultural and social uses, in the teaching and research uses, and in what we can refer also to cultural right clash, so disability, we didn't really have a real harmonization. What is this chart showing you? It's a summary of 660 pages, so uh, it doesn't tell you too much, but in the first line you have the degree of harmonization by law in member states. In the second line you have the degree of harmonization by case law, the gaps in national legislations in the balancing, and the degree of flexibility that member states show compared to the level you have uh, set by the EU. Minus and plus and equal is kind of intuitive, so I won't push it forward, but these are all the categories of uses we mapped, so uses allowed against copyright. The most drastic situation is there in parody, in cultural and social uses, and in teaching and research. So those are the areas where you actually find, and uh, I will show you in a moment, the most fragmented and least harmonized setting. Teaching and research in most member states has just exceptions for teaching. Other member states regulate them together and a few separated. You have different categories of beneficiaries, different rules. It's just a couple of common elements but full fragmentation in terms of beneficiaries, rights and works covered in quantity. And here you can see once again, visually, what I'm talking about when I say fragmentation. So you don't really have the very same geometry of exception in any of the member state. So if you don't have the same rule regarding who benefits from the exception, which works are covered, how much can be covered, which entities can use it, geolocalization and digital users, then of course, that means that with digitization, none of these exceptions really effectively works because legal certainty means that users of exceptions don't have the courage to use them because they're afraid of infringement. The more legal uncertainty you have, the worse is for users because before infringing, you think twice. But in terms of cultural uses, the situation is even worse. 
because you have a piecemeal approach to cultural uses and preservation. You don't have a single exception, but you have several, private study, lending, preservation, and you have really different combinations in different member states, not always implemented in practice. You have a couple of elements in common, such as uh, beneficiaries, but with different approaches, the purpose of the use, the quantity of the use, re remuneration schemes, but you have huge divergences in terms of works that can be covered by these exceptions and in terms of rights that can be covered. So sometimes you just have reproduction, sometimes you also have communication to the public, not always, or distribution, which means that in many instances, you may have preservation, but not access, or at least not as much as we would like to. The, all the exceptions before the Info Society Directive remained, so they were not streamlined according to what I showed you in 2001, and not even the intervention of the Court of Justice on e-lending or on digitization were actually taken up by member states. So the only real harmonization we got, and is not really functioning so well, is the one on orphan works and the Marrakesh Treaty, afterwards Marrakesh Directive, on the um, creation of accessible work for visually impaired individuals. And this is what I'm talking about when I say uh, divergences. If you see, there are several different diverging, diverging points under works, rights, and beneficiaries covered. The green means positive. The uh, red means negative. You can see from the number of states indicated there that there is not a single item where you actually have streamlining on content. So this scatter, this flawed framework, created, the, of course, uh, problems because exceptions are territorial. They are just valid in the state granting the exceptions. So those are state balance. Given that none of these provisions tell us if they are mandatory or not, contractual autonomy means that right holders may limit these exceptions. So you have even another layer of uncertainty. The public domain gets actually privatized, and most of the cultural heritage institutions refrain from engaging in certain uh, cultural preservation and access activities because there are too high transaction costs in agreeing with right holders. So for this reason, they, they refrain. And also collective management, because of this uncertainty, is far too expensive. It has costs which it shouldn't have on the public because, of course, it's the public paying CMOs to pay right holders. So the public pays much more than what we would need to. Plus, you also have an exhaustive list of exceptions. So the exceptions we have is what we can use. There is no possibility to expand compared to what the EU stated. Now, in front of this framework, we got a very long path from 2001 to 2019 when the copyright in the digital single market directive entered into force. So there was a huge debate. 10 plus year of debate on the fact that from this green paper of 2008, down there in guidelines, memorandum of understanding on out of commerce works, on orphan works, they were all pointing out that we would actually need a blanket exception for preservation. Then exception shouldn't be territorial, that we should also take care of format shifting from material to digital, that we should broaden the type of materials that are subject to this cultural uses exception. So involving also audiovisual works and also private entities and not just public entities. Um, but the focus became more and more, and this is the impact assessment of this big directive of 2019, the focus became more and more digital preservation and cross border uses and out of commerce work. So the more we went on, the more certain problems which were spotted in 2008 got lost. E-lending was one of them. The only thing which actually was positive was the introduction of mandatory exceptions. So this directive finally realized that to go on with optional exceptions that member states can pick and choose was everything was but good. So we needed to implement something mandatory that all member states have in the same way. And this is what actually did. And with this, I'm running to, to the closing. The current state of the art, which you are going to discuss 
in the next panels. So we got this female copyright in the digital single market directive. I'm afraid that the slides from my format to this format got completely screwed, but I will send you the PDF afterwards so that you will be able to read what's written there. Let's skip on the tax and data mining. The real uh, two exceptions, mandatory exceptions introduced, which are important for cultural preservation and access, were the one on digital education. So the possibility for uh, member states to, the possibility, the duty of the member states to introduce an exception for making available online and reproducing material for teaching also in digital setting, so cross-border users. And the, preserve, the um, exception for reproduction and communication to the public for preservation of uh, cultural collections, Article 5 and Article 6. Those texts are very detailed, they are mandatory, but even if they are mandatory, in our mapping, we still realized that there are permanent divergences in the implementation by member states, because every time there is a bit of leeway, for member states to go, then you clearly see divergences. In terms of digital education, you have various, a various patchwork. You have states that implemented these digital education exceptions under quotation, like Italy. God knows why, I would say. Divergent divergences in terms of beneficiaries, in terms of rights included and works included. Some countries were very stiff, other a bit more flexible. And the problem is also in the sense that in digital education, you have countries requiring remuneration and opting for licenses, while others are more liberal and they go for direct exceptions without remuneration. So the patchwork remained the same across Europe. But in terms of cultural heritage, well, that's probably the area where you have more convergence. So in the implementation of the digitization exception, Article 6, you got basically all member states cutting and pasting the European text, which means that we got a bit of streamlining. And uh, we also got certain member states that um, took advantage of a margin of flexibility that was left to them to broaden the range of beneficiaries of this exception by covering, for example, also audiovisual heritage institutions. Works covered are very broad, and just in few countries, you got further criteria introduced. So in terms of digital preservation, that was a step forward. So that's a positive take. But there were plenty of opportunities which were missed, and that's the horizontal assessment by member states. In which sense? They didn't stretch the borders as much as they could have done. So if at the EU level, the compromise set the benchmark law, member states that had the possibility to go up, to go over the, the benchmark set by EU, didn't really do it. So we limited ourselves to the compromise that was reached at the EU level. But the most important thing, which I want you to, to notice, is that no single national legislator thought about putting together the pieces of the puzzle. So using this new big reform to correct, update, and streamline previous exceptions and limitations or other flexibility tools. So they did their homework, they implemented the directive, and not even everyone, because there are plenty of, <laughs> there are a couple of states where they are in this moment under infringement procedure for non-transposition, like Poland. But those who implemented it, well, Italy was on the edge for a while. We always, we always arrive at the very last moment. But what, what happened basically was that those exceptions which were optional, which were not streamlined, remained as such. So what we, what we can say in this very moment, and we try to take the positive lens, okay, the optimistic lens, something happened. So now we have a common exception for digital preservation. We have orphan works, out of common works digitization that shift from licensing to exceptions if you cannot license out of commerce works. So we made a couple of steps forward. This is not to say that we need to cry as much. We were crying before the um, implementation, actually before the entry into force of the CDSM. But there are still plenty of things we can do. And I hope that we will be able to discuss this in more details in the, in the rest 
of the day. So our policy recommendations in general for copyright exceptions and limitations was to move towards full harmonization. So let's stop with this patchwork approach. Let's do like we do for exclusive rights. All exceptions should be mandatory and not just from this moment onwards. What we probably need is to stop with the use pays approach and to move towards purpose-oriented limitations. So we need to say that in order to pursue a certain goal, you can freely reproduce, distribute, and communicate to the public, not to just specify works and use and beneficiaries so strictly as we are doing. Purpose-oriented limitation gives you much more flexibility in adapting closed list. We also invited the EU legislator to implement court of justice doctrine. In, uh, in their text, simply because national courts don't seem to care about it, or at least not so many of them. So probably if that's implemented in the law, the situation may change a bit, but also to go on and do a joint update of all exceptions and limitation with horizontal clauses that, for example, change the notion of work and copy from material to digital, because the entire digital um, world is excluded from exceptions and limitations when it's not explicitly mentioned. So a joint update of all the exceptions and limitations we have after an impact assessment of it, of their impact on the right holders, whatever you want, should be done. Otherwise, we keep on having exceptions that are just for the material world, and very few things are happening in the material world compared to digital. We need to specify the notion of protected work and also to evaluate the opportunity to introduce flexibility for transformative users. Then we made a number of recommendations for specific cultural users, for specific users, but I think that the most important for you for the debate of today are the two sets of policy recommendations we advance for research and education and cultural users. On research and education, we advise to introduce a general mandatory research exception as they did for digital education. Digital education and digital research should be treated equally. So go beyond tax and other mining. We need to align EU copyright law to open science policies. And that's what the commission is working on now. So apparently the only area they are willing to intervene uh, at the level of the EU commission before the, this commission term will end uh, on copyright is exactly alignment with open science policies, and that's also space for cultural use preservation, so intervention on contract law, mandatory diversion right, and so forth, and then verify, that's the last, whether or not to streamline the exception for traditional teaching and the exception for digital teaching. In terms of cultural uses, now here you don't really see anything, so I'm going to read them to you. We advise to clarify, but Conrad will tell you more about it later, the treatment of electronic lending under, after the Ferenig in Open Barrier Bibliothek and case, because we are still in the mess. There is a case of the Court of Justice, but that's still not law, to be honest. To move towards a greater harmonization of general cultural uses in order to enhance cross-border cooperation, so one single exception like Article 6 CDSM is not enough to enhance cooperation and about cost. To move finally beyond preservation because it's not enough and also to introduce mandatory horizontal exceptions for access and reuse. To introduce a provision to positively protect public domain, which at the moment we don't have because it's just defined a contrario and there is huge uncertainty and public domain is key for cultural heritage access, preservation and participation. To rethink freedom of panorama because it's not true that it's streamlined as they said in the impact assessment. To make an impact assessment on the real impact of what cultural heritage institutions are doing on right holders because at the moment there are not enough economic evidence of all what the publishers are shouting about. And uh, also to provide, which we don't have, an automatic shift from uh, uh, extended collective licensing for out-of-commerce work to exceptions every time the system doesn't work effectively at the level of collective management. That's something we don't have, but it's the only way to help cultural heritage institutions 
do their own job without getting stuck into CMOs problems. So that's all what I wanted to tell you. Apologies if I took a couple of minutes more. I know that the content is a lot, so I'm very happy to give you more details during the Q&A session. Otherwise, I hope that this presentation was prof profitable to give you a framework for the great discussion. I look forward to engage into with you in the next part of the days. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Katarina. Uh, thank you for setting the scene for today and for showing us, for giving an overview of, uh, I think these are still struggles <laughs> that the uh, that we are witnessing or going through uh, all over Europe, uh, but it was super informative. Are there questions? Czy mają Państwo pytania? Let me get to you. Give it a second. I think it's gonna, it's gonna work. This one, yeah, this one works. Um, I'll do this in English. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I'll keep it short. Um, so you, you, you've set out that basically the exceptions framework at the moment is a mess. Um, what, what's the reason for this? <laughs> Well, the reason for this tracks back in history to when back in 2001, the European legislator believed that exclusive rights needed to be maximum urbanized because those were important for the internal market, while for exceptions, there was no convergence among member states. So since there was no convergence, they stated, mm, that's too linked to cultural sensitiveness and policies of member states, so let them be. It's not going to have an impact on the internal market. It was clear that that was not the case. It was clear that to make a list of optional limitations was the right way to hell because it was better to keep the situation as it was before. There was more convergence before 2001 than after the harmonization of the EU. If you look at the, at the, at the new exception spring in here and there. So it, the the problem of having a mess in this patchwork is that you don't have any single category which the Court of Justice can really interpret in an effective manner. So the fact that there is so much patchwork makes it also very difficult, if not impossible, for the Court of Justice to harmonize bottom-up. And it's a mess, the fact that courts, national courts, are not always so trained in looking outside their borders. So they don't even know how to interpret what the Court of Justice does and says, or and, and apply it to their own exceptions and limitations. So the only way forward to clean the mess is to do what they are doing now, either go for regulation or go for mandatory exceptions with a very detailed content. They are doing it for AI. They are doing it for digital markets. They are doing it for data because all what concerns data is a regulation now. So the question is, why can't they do it for IP, since it touches in the digital arena the very same type of assets and it has the very same importance for the digital single market? Okay, then I have one. So uh, Stephen asked uh, about why, and I want to ask about what comes next. So you listed a long list of uh, policy recommendations that you discussed in the project that you think that would be good steps, uh, like necessary steps for us to, to really align the law with the, with the mission and the role of the organizations in question. So my question is, if you were to prioritize, because we know that it's, it's a long process ahead of us, that we are all, I hope, willingly, uh, so we are willing to take on and kind of jump on this adventure, and it's gonna take time, we know this, but, to kind of prioritize the area. You mentioned open science and the discussion that is currently ongoing within the, the commission, but is there anything else you would then flag? Okay, this really needs to come next. I think that open science uh, comes first uh, for a number of reasons, because once you have free access to research and not just publication, but data, then you basically open uh, an entire new uh, 
world for cultural uh, heritage access and preservation, and uh, in general for the right to take part in cultural life. That is also going to make publisher change business models and way to approach their own rights. So that's the first area. The second would really be electronic lending because electronic lending is something we need to intervene on that's going to be fundamental to give access also to areas that are compromised in their physical access to, uh, to collections. After e-lending, what we need to reflect on is uh, whether our legal framework, EU legal framework, is really fit for addressing this access problem at the cross-border level. Because of course, having e-lending is one thing at the EU level, the other is having communication to the public of, con of collection, all type of collections uh, available uh, uh, all across the, the union. And I really believe that at the end of the day, what will need to be faced, and in this, the commission is not really willing to engage, and I understand because the stake is high, is to look at cultural heritage in a broader manner. We stick to the idea that is glam, and is glam, but glam doesn't just contain traditional works, music, folklore, any other form of underground art, they are simply not covered by most of the exceptions in member states. And those is, this, that's cultural heritage. And it's not really considered as such video games. Those video games that are not really played anymore, they are part of cultural heritage in certain community. They are not covered by uh, any exception. I know that it may sound like, okay, we have bigger problems, but why do we, why do we think about that? is because technology runs much faster than us. So it's better if we start thinking now to solve the problem in the next 10 years. Yeah, and I think the pandemic really showed us how speed th uh, speedily th things can change and are changing. Yeah. Uh, thank you for this. We have room for one more. Mamy jeszcze przestrzeń na jedno pytanie. Or not. <laughs> Uh, thank you for excellent speech and also for the great uh, uh, work did by your, by your team. I have one question. Don't you think that many, too many intermediaries affect, uh, affect the process of dissemination and also affect the copyright situation in, uh, of the GLAM institution? I mean, too many uh, intermediaries, uh, publishers, you know, and some other, this uh, uh, person who are between the author and between the GLAM. Yes and no, in the sense that I believe that the main problem we have is that the, when the Collective Management Organization Directive, which I don't know if you are acquainted with, but it created, a, it won, the aim was to liberalize the market for collective management organization in Europe, basically focused on uh, commercial works. And that's why you also have just a multi-territorial licensing for music works, but they simply didn't care about the rest because that was what pushing the most. So to have an intermediary is, is not bad if we are able to reduce cost. In order to reduce cost, we need to centralize more. We need to understand what are the best licensing schemes we can implement. And in this sense, the Scandinavian model of uh, extended collective licensing seems to be the one that costs the less, that at least transaction cost and less administrative cost. And then we need to make the job of those collective management organizations as transparent as possible, particularly when it's about public money, to be understandable also the way out it impacts on the, um, on the public budget. And uh, to shift also towards a system of private copy levy, like, you know, remuneration schemes that are managed by CMOs and they are another, like, second best but still good tool to create more access and participation would be a way. So this is to say that at the end of the day, I'm not completely against intermediaries. I think that we need them. We need to about their cost. And that's something that just the legislator can do by intervening on information asymmetries and uh, fragmentation of, uh, of, the, of the framework we have. 
Thank you very much, Katrina. I'm just going to double check with Kasia if we have questions or comments from the online participants. Not yet, but this is uh, so that will be an encouragement. So we also want to hear from from you. I think we ha I see that we have more than oh I can't see it properly, but 300 people with us online. Uh, thank you for uh, for being with us. So we also want to hear from you. Uh, thank you, Katarina. Thank you for taking us through the European journey. I'll switch smoothly into Polish. Now we'll now move on from this European perspective to the Polish perspective. Let me now ask Ms. Sybila Stanisławska Klotz to take us on a Polish journey now. And let me now invite our experts here. Good morning. We can begin the first session. When I was getting ready for this session, I was wondering how to welcome you. So in a library, we mostly read and borrow books from. So if the if we read and borrow books, we choose the best one, especially mm, the best uh, references to the function of a library. That is why. I chose Umberto Eco on libraries. Obviously, I'm not going to read the whole book, but let me quote two fragments of it. I believe that in every noble place, so I believe that in such a noble place, it would be appropriate that du like during a religious ceremony, you should begin with reading a book. And in the first part, Umberto Eco quotes a fragment of the Babel Library of Luis Borges from fiction. And at the very end of his speech, of his address that he gave at the Milan library, he says, so if a library is a model of the universe, as Borges puts it, let's make it universe at our own, tailored to our own possibilities. So how to make the universe tailored to our possibilities, but the possibilities of human beings of the 21st century, not artificial intelligence though, but human beings of the 21st century. Therefore, we invited the best specialists to the panel, and we are going to share the, the knowledge concerning copyright and to uh, adapt them to the to our needs so that they could serve us we readers uh, in the 21st century the, our guests are dr joanna marcinkowska my great colleague from the chair of intellectual property from the faculty of law and administration at the Aguilonian University. I will present the, and also Dr. Timoteusz Barański, a doctor of legal sciences, for a dozen of years, he provides services to cultural institution, legal counseling in copyright, especially with mass digitalization of collections. And also uh, Ms. Katarzyna Szlaska, deputy director of the University Library in Warsaw. This is the sequence in which the speakers are going to contribute. 
she graduated uh, at Library Sciences at the Aquilonian University, working for many years in national libraries and universities. And in 2070, she took the post of the deputy director of the National Library. And since 2007, she has been the deputy uh, director of the University Library in Warsaw. So now I would like to give the floor over to the speakers. So Dr. Joanna Marcinkowska, I would like to ask for some slight support. Ladies and gentlemen, hello. I would like to thank for inviting me to take part in this conference. Uh, so, as you realized, this is really a fascinating subject and also it is uh, kept in a multifactorial aspect, which make this conference even more valuable. So, my contribution has a character of uh, it has an introductory character which reminds us the current regulations in Polish copyright, which can also be useful for people who might not be uh, aware of uh, all the issues of fair use in the aspect of glam for example which is uh, which is also uh, of introductory character to further subjects which we are going to be discussed by the next speakers at this conference mostly in the aspect of uh, the plan and designed changes which are expected, which have been expected for some time. And recently uh, we, we realized that they soon be implemented. I divided into my presentation into a few subjects, into a few points, but the emphasis will be different because uh, it is not possible to place the attention and time evenly. That is why I would like to begin with a small introduction or reference to the sources of law uh, so that to present some net network uh, of the sources which are binding in this context in Poland. And later on, traditionally, I will move on to the uh, copyright and uh, the, its content. It will not be surprising for any of you, but it's worth mentioning. But also in the area where we, uh, where I'm going to concentrate more, it's going to be a set associating various kinds of regulations which regulate the fair use of works, laying some emphasis on the possibilities of the use of works by various entities within the GLAM sector. And I chose the most representative, that is the library privilege, uh, promotion and publishing privilege, also the law, uh, the right quote and also the possibilities of reporting the works and finally the subject that is really problematic that is the regulation concerning the works which are not available on the market. And uh, as we know very well from the paper of the previous speaker, 
Uh, we know that when it comes to the sources of law, this network can begin with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, whose Article 27 states that everyone has the right to participate freely in the cultural life of their society, to enjoy the arts and to participate and benefit from the science and its development and its progress. When it comes to the constitution of the Republic of Poland, and this privilege was transplanted into Polish uh, regulation, we can refer, for example, to Article 73, which says that every person shall be uh, granted the freedom of artistic expression, scientific research, and publication of the results of the research, plus freedom of teaching and freedom, freedom to use the goods of culture. These are very general terms, but they have some uh, development in some further regulations, which are quoted by specific, which nominate specific institutions to pursue certain tasks and whose declaration can be made uh, real. So it is the act on libraries, the act on museums, and the act on the national archive resources and archives. So I'm limiting the, the sources to the glam sector and all the entities which operate uh, uh, with the, and which pursue their tasks defined in those specific acts are meant to satisfy the educational, cultural and information needs of the society, plus also the, uh, the dissemination of knowledge and culture and its popularization. We know very well what was also mentioned and observed that apart from the freedoms and the rights that have been vested in society, we also have the uh, clash with the rights that are given to the authors, creators, and other entities. These are the copyright and moral right, uh, which uh, we must not forget, especially in the context of the use of a work of art or any other work. When it comes to copyright, to economic right, you also mentioned that uh, these are the rights of, uh, of, of exclusive character. So they are uh, uh, mentioned here and they are vested in the creator of a work. Therefore, it is only the creator that has the right to use his or her work, to dispose of the rights to that work. And let me modify the content of Article 17, plus the right to remuneration for the use of the work. Obviously, these economic rights are limited in time, and as it is generally accepted in the European Union, this time span is 75 years after the death of the author. When it comes to moral rights, uh, uh, the contents is defined also by copyright, so they protect the uh, bond between the author and the work, which is uh, defined by specific rights. So this is the right to the authorship to sign the work with a name or a nickname, the right to the integrity of the work, which in the contents of the use is of specific importance, especially when we use only fragments of some pieces of works. And finally, for example, the right for the supervision of the manner of the use of the work, and it continues. So as opposed to economic rights, the moral rights are unlimited. Uh, therefore, there are, they continue after the death of the creator.
creator or author, which means that the users should respect these rights uh, in an unlimited way. So there is obviously a tendency that the further from the period of protection of economic rights, the moral rights are weaker. However, it is not a very good tendency. So when it comes to the regulations, which might be interesting for us from the point of view of functioning of GLAM institutions, we can find them in the section of copyright, which defines the fair use of a work, which is the construction which tries to reconcile the interest of the recipient user society with the interest of the uh, of the uh, of those who enjoy the economic rights and first of all we would like to observe to pay attention to article 28 which is defined as the uh, library privilege and library prerogative also 33.3 which is the prerogative of promotion and publication and let's let's uh, define it like that and also the right uh, of quote uh, which can be defined in such a way and also in case of the report or on current events so also in the glam uh, environment various events might happen so there is also the privilege to use the special work certainly in all of these cases there is a framework for use so there are some internal prerequisites which should be explored so as not to the economic rights are not violated or infringed so uh, let's move to the first regulation that is the library um, privilege the library prerogative so i believe it will be quite difficult to follow this information therefore i divided uh, this into pieces and uh, I present this in fragments. So for a start, traditionally, I would like to point to the fact that the current wording of the regulation is the outcome of the implementation of the, uh, of the Directive on Copyright in Information Society, which is the right to reproduce and also communicate in public, plus the implementation of the directive on the right of uh, lending uh, and by means of the implementation and the change of the regulation, there is the rights that is the remuneration defined. So how does um, uh, the regulation look like? So it indicates to what entities, to what institution it may apply. So um, there are uh, the list is quite lengthy. So these are educational institutions, universities, research institutions, uh, academic institutions, Polish Academy of Sciences, libraries, museums, and archives. So this is the subjective scope, the subject matter scope. So also the Act on Copyright specifies it, uh, which into which which I would not like to quote in the detail but what are the educational institution this is the reference to the act on the educational system universities research institutes academic institutes libraries museums and archives so this is a closed catalog of all the institutions all the listed institutions libraries museums uh, and archives act are pursuant to specific acts uh, which define various types of institutions so let me have a look at the list certainly i'm not going to discuss everything in detail but let me mention that these are diverse institutions with various profile and scope so there is a um, diversity of the institutions which to which these regulations apply when it comes to museums let me mention various categories um, and also 
in an analogous way, the situation is similar when it comes to archives. So here we have a question, what uh, these institutions can do, which actions they can with regards to the use of the, um, of the work. So let me present to you um, a scattered regulation which specifies what actions this may be so this can be lending within the scope of the statutory tasks which means of lending the copies of distributed work also the reproduction of the works which are held in their collections in order to complete preserve and protect these collections um, these are additional circumstances and also the, uh, these institutions may render these collections available for research purposes or for learning purposes with the use of their terminals which are located in the premises. And these actions um, should not be carried out for gaining a direct or direct indirect material benefit. When it comes to the subject matter scope, which means what are what might be the limitations of such use. So the basically this can be any work uh, uh, without any specific limitation or there is no listed example of works. So the uh, the um, uh, the legislator defines that this is with the exception for the so computer software and databases which meet all the requirements for a work. Obviously, we need to remember about the correct application of the objects of related rights, such as videograms and phonograms which belong to the same category. And also we need to uh, pay attention at the fact that the listed uh, entities, the listed institutions, uh, use do not only the work which is subject to protection but also they use the regulations which allow for the use of the protected works but also it is possible to use such works which became a part of public domain either because of the time span that passed or that they are valuable on the basis of open licenses and we have the special category of the uh, 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 works that are orphaned or out of commerce. So this is the network when it comes to the types of works. Let's move on to more details when it comes to the ways in which works can be used. So this is lending, lending of copies of distributed works. So first and foremost, a distributed work is a work that has been made available uh, publicly with the permission of its author. And the issue of lending is also defined by regulations of the Act. So what this right means as opposed to rental. So lending might also concern uh, interlibrary loans. And we have this notion of lending copies. So if we are to directly interpret the law, we mean here the carriers, the mediums. And we know that this is problematic. So when it comes to the current regulation, current law, the question is whether this scope of use as part of lending can be expanded to digital forms, or should we just stick to the act? Now, when it comes to this first approach, uh, the approach of the Court of Justice of the European Union uh, 
sees uh, the need to expand legal regulations. But since this verdict of the uh, Court of Justice from 2016 doesn't apply directly to the Polish law. It's a vague situation, um, let's call it this way, which introduces this uncomfortable situation when we are not very sure of how this law could be used. Now, it, when it comes to dissemination, it's an issue of moral rights and it should be taken into account. Now, when it comes to lending, as I've mentioned before, in the Polish Act, we already have information on lending and remuneration, so this public lending right. However, this topic does not concern users or libraries because these are not the entities that are due to pay remuneration. So I'm not going to dwell on this topic right now. What is important is another form of exploitation, namely reproduction of works, which are part of the entity's own collections. And the entities mentioned at the beginning uh, can um, reproduce them to supplement, uh, preserve, and protect the collections. And something that introduces certain havoc is that we talk about reproduction of works and not copies of works. So this usage can be slightly broader here, and there's no this requirement that the work has to be previously distributed, so communicated publicly uh, by the author previously. So works that have not been communicated beforehand uh, can also be uh, reproduced. Uh, so, for example, if uh, this is happening after the author's death. Now, the uh, complementing or protection, so complementing, this allows to make a uh, copy of a work that, for example, went missing. Now, protection and preservation are to uh, make sure that a given copy is not lost, is to prevent us from uh, losing a copy. However, this doesn't mean that the number of copies can be increased. So, for example, if we make a copy of a work to preserve or protect this work, then it has to be put aside and a new copy is introduced uh, for further use. Now, the um, of course, libraries and other entities, they can buy further copies. And another form of exploitation is uh, making collections available uh, for research via terminals, but these terminals have to be on site of a given entity. However, this does not mean that only in the rooms of these entities, in the buildings of the entities, but if a given entity is scattered around um, a given uh, city, for example, this regulation or this possibility of exploitation uh, cannot be used if this um, if making a copy available is based on a license so this license uh, should be used as first now for all these um, instances of exploitation, it is said that uh, no direct or indirect financial gain can be obtained from it. Now, for 
library lending now when it comes to public lending right it is derived from the directive and we have a limited number of those who have this right to remuneration for public lending so this is for the lending of copies of works by public libraries and it is for works in polish and these are not the entities that lend the works that are to pay the remuneration but it is done from by the fund for the promotion of culture and it is done by an organization of uh, collective management, copyright Polska. Now, when it comes to glam sector and the privileges, we have this promotion and uh, publication privilege or prerogative. So uh, works may be used to advertise a publicly accessible exhibition or the public sale of works to the extent justified by the promotion of that exhibition or sale to the exclusion of other commercial use. Now, the use referred um, in this previous paragraph shall relate in particular to publicly accessible exhibitions, which can be part of a library, for example, or a different cultural center, and include the use of works in advertisements, catalogues. So we have here the scope of use determined. And what else should we pay attention to? As I have uh, mentioned before, this regulation results from the implementation of the Directive on Information Society when it comes to the limitation to the right to reproduction. Now, when it comes to subject matter, so to whom is this regulation addressed? Well, it is not limited only to the entities mentioned before, namely museums, galleries, and um, exhibition halls, because it also says that in particular, uh, these are included. Now, when it comes to the subject matter, we have no limitation here, uh, except for traditionally uh, computer programs. However, it is important that these works used should be presented at these exhibitions, or there should be for sale. So it's not about the use where we use works of a different author uh, during an exhibition. Now, when it comes to the scope of exploitation, we're talking about use for promotion and advertising concerning exhibitions and sale of works. So they can be presented in advertisements, catalogues, promotional materials, and this can be also done online. So this uh, promotion can also take place in other um, media. And also the exhibiting or making um, copies of the works available in a different way. So for example, through playing them or screening them. And the exhibition can be any type of an exhibition, but it has to be uh, open to the public. These requirements, um, such as uh, the purchase of a ticket 
or the introduction of age limit, well, they don't mean that a given exhibition is not open to the public. Now, with the use of such works, we should also pay attention to the fact that we should remember moral rights, namely uh, telling who the author of a given work is, so we shouldn't avoid infringing the right to integrity. Uh, there are possible technical modifications, uh, such as making a work, uh, a work smaller if it is to be presented on a leaflet. But here we should also think about moral rights. As I have mentioned before, the glam sector entities, when they use or create their own works, uh, such as educational materials, they can also use the right to quote, which is envisaged by article number 29, and, as I have mentioned before, they can use it in reports on current events. If this is, for example, this exhibition or sale that I've mentioned before. So here, works can also be used. I believe that my time is almost over, so I'm not going to describe in great detail one more solution that has been envisaged by the copyright law, especially that this topic, due to the structure of this uh, regulation, that is a part of the act causes certain uh, reservations also with regard to the verdict of the um, Court of Justice of the European Union when it comes to the implementation of these regulations and actions that can be taken by right holders when they are to verify whether they're works have been included on the list of out-of-commerce works and also the right to uh, object to the exploitation of a work or uh, its reproduction, for example, online. So they are not envisaged by other uh, legal regulations starting from the uh, Bernese um, Convention. So they have been introduced into the Polish Act, however, they don't correspond with the requirements of, for example, the Bernese uh, Convention, and therefore they cause certain reservations. So yes, the regulations have been implemented, however, they are not used also because no um, collective management organization has been appointed. And since we're going to talk about this topic from the perspective of the uh, project, well, I will stop now and thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Doctor, for discussing the current legal environment. And now I would like to ask Mr. Uh, Timoteusz Barański, Dr. Barański, to discuss the current uh, challenges. Thank you very much. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers of the conference. And I'm really uh, honored uh, that I'm here and I'm happy that such a meeting is taking place because I feel uh, I feel the need for further discussion with regards to the glam sector. So this is one of the key areas that this is discussed. So I'm really happy, but I'm not going to make lengthy introductions, but let me get to the point. So if I, if 
if we are to discuss whether the implementation of the DSA director supports the mission of the GLAM sector, we need to think, first of all, what are the um, uh, uh, the properties of a good regulation and also I should think what previous speakers mentioned. Ladies and gentlemen, in my opinion, the basic property of the sector is the low appetite for risk. Low appetite is not a very fortunate term, but in the term in the area of risk management, it has been included. So it it's quite right, I must say, because I would like to illustrate that there are some categories of institutions which are really unwilling in, to get involved in any actions which generate legal risk. With regards to the GLAM sector, it is by all means obvious because it is the outcome of the second feature that I would like to show to you. So it is the lack of investment or budgetary limitations. So uh, if you want to involve in any type of risk, you need to have resources for litigations, the cost of legal representation, the cost of the lowest case. So the if this sector is not very well financially supported, it means that this they might avoid the methods of uh, rendering available to what they say because they would like to avoid the risk. And if they have to choose a number of methods of uh, exploitation of use, they would always select this part of their resources, which will not expose them to any risk. Another reason for the low appetite for legal risk, it is the um, uh, perhaps incorrectly understood the principle of legalism, which is obviously rooted in the Constitution, which is a part of the administrative procedure, but especially su uh, public subjects within the sector, cultural institutions also have this understanding that they make a part of public sector. Therefore, the principle of legalism which tell you that you should work only within the legal limits. Uh, so this, uh, uh, this applies also to them. And it is a very characteristic issue which defines the principle of of uh, cultural heritage, it is also important that it refers to other uh, entities, other institutions uh, present in the cultural market. So given uh, Poland, given also the great damage that Poland experienced during the Second World War, it is still very widely available. So these are the postulates of a good regulation. And from the point of view of these postulates, we need to evaluate the implementation of the ESA uh, directive. So first of all, this means that there is a need of clear and definite regulations which do not generate complex procedures, which do not refer, which do not refer to any general clauses which are able to, which are worded in such a way that people who take decisions concerning specific methods of exploiting or using the collections should uh, decide whether this is admissible or not. The lack of in, uh, sufficient investment for public sector generates the, the method that minimizes the costs, that is, that promotes 
costless, cost free or low cost solutions. So for example, in the area of the use of works, the least costly solution, it is the use of what is a part of public domain. Another example is the fair use, because you ask on the basis of a statutory license, which does not generate any costs. So such a postulate would be the outcome of this feature of this property that is the low expenditure on the glam sector. However, the mass character of the collections uh, leads to the fact that on the one hand, they should allow for rendering a valuable of what the uh, this institution have in the resources or their collections. But on the other hand, the possibilities of using um, these collections with, from the point of view of their use. So nobody will concentrate on a single individual book from the point of digitalization. Simply the whole part of collections should be the subject of the evaluation of the possible legal risk. So let's move to the very directive and how it uh, can be implemented. So generally speaking, the directive on copyright on a unified digital market was not satisfactory for anyone, only for those who received their, um, their related rights. So all actors, all stakeholders uh, of the market of intellectual property are complaining about it. Also, it is a some kind of uh, this uh, discouraging from the point of view of glam sector, because many things have been said that the monopolist concept of intellectual property should be abandoned and the public aspect of intellectual property should become a subject of a more extensive normative activity. So from the point of view of what the directive brings, so I must say that apart from the works that are out of commerce and the things that we don't know uh, what it concerns and also the concept of data mining and uh, also the uh, more uh, uh, novel solutions. From the point of view of the sect of the glam sector, the most important thing uh, covers three issues affected by the directive. That is the fair use in order to preserve the, so, the collections, the use of the out of commerce work, and the draft says that uh, it shouldn't be not available for sale, and also the use of text and data. Because directive was not satisfactory for anyone, and some of the stakeholders, member states voted against against it and also uh, some of the regulations were questioned and uh, sent to and appealed against to the uh, European Court of Justice. Poland was a part of these countries too. So this was the minimum implementation. This was what the government adopted. So these were only some minor changes. We do only what we must do so that to adapt our Copyright Act to the requirements of the directive and basically nothing more. This approach is in a way understandable and uh, uh, I would not criticize it on mass because the directive does not introduce any particular revolution. However, it seems to me that if we look at the draft that I would like to show to you at the next slides, uh, we can have a reflection that, first of all, some solution could be uh, 
uh, should have been analyzed in more detail and perhaps some attempts to implement it in a better way should be taken into consideration. The second thing is that the directive allow for the interference in the third use uh, for the institutions of cultural heritage was an attempt to put in order and systematize issues concerning the fair use. And also it seems to me that the, this approach, the minimum implementation resulted in a very conservative approach, which finally, I don't know whether if it's justified or not. I do hope that I will manage to do it within the time limit, but there are some issues in the directive which with a more extensive interpretation, perhaps slightly controversial, will allow to uh, in, enlarge the activity of the gland sector and the institutions of cultural heritage. So it's really bad that the legislation did not take such a decision, even if this was a risk of a clash with the uh, European Commission. There is nothing wrong with that. Member states do engage in disputes. They carry out the litigations in front of the European Court of Justice. So this, this is the risk that, in my opinion, was acceptable because you, as opposed to the institutions of uh, the, the state, as opposed to the institutions of cultural heritage, the state has a large appetite for the legal risk. And here I'm showing the to you the basis the basic regulation of the directive, which uh, the, concerns the fair use concerning the uh, protection of the um, preservation of the collections, allowing for the reproduction. So this is the regulation that, uh, um, that repeats the previous director as a facultative method of reproduction. Now it makes it an obligatory option. So we can say that this is the EU diverging from the principle of the author's monopolistic work, but this is not a great change in my opinion. In my opinion, simply the fair use was made obligatory. And still here in Poland, it had already been obligatory. So basically this is true. What is significant here is that here, the uh, European legislation stated that this concerns all works of art, all works, sorry. So this is what I would like to return to. So what was done with the um, with the draft within the draft? So it was the change, the amendment of Article Twenty Eight, Section One Point Two of the Copyright uh, Law. So it says that uh, uh, cultural heritage institutions may reproduce the works permanently. Uh, and these works um, must belong to the collections, and this might be irrespectively, regardless of format or medium. So uh, what is, seems to be missing here was some premeditation, because this regulation of the directive says that it talks about works and other objects which belong to, which are held permanently in their collections. Uh, motive 21 of the directive says that it does not have to be ownership title, but it should be based on any other legal title, but also uh, this must refer to the uh, uh, to ownership as such. But in our case, the uh, author of the draft decided to intervene in the contents of this regulation. The, I wonder why the 
um, statement about their own collection was left. So perhaps it is the pro-EU interpretation. So perhaps it does not have to be owned by this institution. But let's remember that uh, the GLAM institutions have a very low appetite for litigation and for, and for legal risk. And that is why some of them might say that they are unwilling to render anything available because it is not the ownership of the previous institution that belongs to a given sector. So when implementing the regulations concerning the works which are out of commerce, which refer exactly to the very same notion which belongs to the collections of the institutions of cultural heritage. So this was defined exactly in the way it should. So it does not refer to the issue of ownership, but to the facts of state, to the uh, actual situation, in other words. The justification, the legal grounds for the draft uh, and for the amendment amendment of the regulations define also the issue of ownership. So this motive this regulation from the director does not refer to ownership. So why did they decide to leave the term ownership and create a hybrid uh, term of the previous wording and the new wording? So. Uh, uh, also, this refers to Article 6 of the DSM Directive. I don't know. It's quite difficult to understand. And this is the nuance which might in future affect the future possibilities of the sector, of the GLAM sector. So this is what I was showing to you. And then we have the Darmstadt ruling. So Darmstadt case was the ruling of the European Court of Justice, in which the European Court of Justice said one thing that was good and two things that were bad, because first of all, they said that the libraries might um, are not allowed to digitalize the in their entire collections. Secondly, when analyzing the German act of law, they said that such a solution in which you limit the possibility of lending if something is seen in terminals, it means the criteria of the three level lending. But also they mentioned one good thing. So if we are talking about the fair use, which consists in the possibility of uh, lending on terminals. So although the directive did not make any space for uh, rendering in available in such a way, so uh, they asked how they may render it available on the terminals if they are unable to reproduce it. So the possibility of reproduction was an indirect conclusion from the previous class. So the we in fact moved to Article 28, Section 2, the solution that the German court defined that it is compliant with the three level test. So uh, once we decide to observe the minimum of choice and the, the rigor of the public discourse, I must say that it was a complete aberration. I don't know why this uh, clause was transposed to our copyright, because it is based on the complete difference of terms, and it uh, actually denies the rule of the license making special fiction that a digital form or digital use is the same as copy. So this is, I don't know, it is some kind of reductionism or historic understanding, historical understanding. So, uh, but this actually is out of date. Uh, so this br brings only practical problem because the court said that such a solution is not uh, only compliant with the three stage test, but uh, uh, they also refer to whether such an exception is possible. So therefore, in my opinion, we should 
consider on the occasion of systematizing the issues of licenses, because if we have to introduce the changes to Article 28, why do we need to leave these articles? Perhaps this regulation should be repealed because it limits the digital possibilities of the institutions of um, uh, cultural heritage, or perhaps they should think about the another form of limitation because the three-stage test should be uh, applicable. Another issue is that uh, uh, it is the relationship between the licenses because the Court of Justice said that the, in the Darmstadt ruling uh, it was possible to uh, reproduct the works in order to make them available on terminals. So we, if we intervene in this regulation, shouldn't we complete the available uh, uh, the uh, available uh, regulations, the available uh, uh, solutions, and to complete it with an objective that is rendering available with the use of terminals, because uh, there should be no doubt that it is legible and permiss permissible also for the institutions within the sector. So if to look into the regulation, this is not the outcome of the content. So only it is the Court of Justice that allowed for this possibility because this is how they understood it. So perhaps this possibility should be normalized and legalized. And also, there is an issue of this unfortunate uh, reproduction for the completion of works. So the regulation of Article 28.1, Section 223, and it says that they should digitalize them for completing the, the collections. And also, uh, we have a statement that the Mm, uh, that the uh, digitalization should not increase the number of works that are rendered available on terminals. So why, how to reconcile the contents of these two regulations? What the institution of cultural heritage, what will they do with the completed collections if they are unable to do anything about it? So actually, I, I'm still waiting for such an interpretation because nothing constructive comes to my mind in this respect. And closing the issue of the fair use, let me draw your attention to one more thing. So the directive in the motives allows uh, for the uh, reproduction that can be trusted to confided to some other people because the institutions of cultural heritage do not have enough financial support they do not have any technical background to uh, to work with digitalization obviously we are not talking about uh, state institutions but there is still a number of other cultural institutions so why is it important this is important because they are very reluctant to take legal risk I mean, the institutions of, uh, of cultural heritage and also the three-stage test uh, suggests that the interpretation should be inclusive, should be narrowed down. So from my own practice, I can tell you that the institutions of cultural heritage frequently wondered whether specific actions, which are the acts concerning the exploitation or the use of works or, or other objects of, uh, in, of intellectual property. So if this is on the basis of statutory authorization, statutory license, does it mean that they can do it with their own resources? Or does it mean that Hey, then that they can commission it to have it done by somebody else because the subject of that permission should be the subject of the addressee of the regulation. 
So it's good that this directive actually extended the interpretation because the legislation said that these institutions do not have any technological resources to execute their right. So this means that it, unfortunately, it was not re reflected in this regulation because if Article 28.1 one was only slightly amended to the uh, institutions of uh, uh, of cultural heritage. And if it said that they might uh, reproduce them or have them reproduced, this would be much clearer for the recipients of the regulation. So ladies and gentlemen, some delicate amendments concerning fair use. This is a legible and clear logic because it it existed before, but in my opinion, uh, more effort should have been taken so that the result should have been better. And now let me move on to the use of the works which are out of commerce. So this is against the institution which is meant to save the orphaned works. Uh, so they do not work uh, very well. So it does not work effectively in Poland. So so it does in other countries because it is strongly overregulated, imposing the possibility of a complex procedure of a direct search. So this is also an option which is not adapted to the glam sector. That is the mass character of the collections. So what we have here, it is the possibility of evaluating whether anybody might digitalize several thousand objects instead of the procedure of a uh, uh, diligent search. So also, given the cost of a diligent search for a specific work, and also a hundred of works uh, that are in public domain, the latter one would be digitalized. Five minutes only, I do apologize, yes. Uh, so I'm really going to summarize it. So. And this was meant to save the orphaned works. So the mechanism, two-stage mechanism was introduced. So first of all, mm, the works which are not available, uh, which are out of commerce on the basis of license. So first of all, license agreements should be, uh, should be uh, signed and executed. So there is the pattern presented in the slide, which illustrates it. So if a work belongs to the collections of a given institution, so if this if the um, organization of collective management uh, is representative for such works, this uh, the work can be um, uh, can be available online. So uh, this can be uh, rendered according to the principle of uh, use. So there is a special procedure for it of uh, putting the institutions of cultural heritage and institutions of collecting management on the list. So we also had it in the act in the regulation. So also what you mentioned, what the previous speaker mentioned, but it doesn't work. Why doesn't it work? Because of the ruling of the Court of Justice, which said that if there is no opt out mechanism, so the works which are out of commerce might, must not be used. So this implementation, this idea how to implement it is basically correct. But what it seems to be missing is that if the work belongs to is belongs to the representative institution of collective management. But there is the principle of freedom of contract of agreements. So the Mm, draft does not provide for any mechanism which would force or which would motivate rather or promote entering into such agreements. Secondly, the directive did not actually rule out who should be supposed to carry out the diligent action to verify whether the work is really out of commerce. 
And also directive specified that the member states are mm, supposed to determine it. So I believe that perhaps it is not necessarily a beneficial solution because everybody might be opportunistic. So if it's not clearly defined, so uh, they will rather place the burden of responsibility on other institutions and the institutions will not be interested. So who will use it if these are paid licenses? One minute, all right. So one more thing that is the distribution of responsibility. So which is also the um, watchword, the possibility provided by the directive in order to regulate the possibility of responsibility for incorrect granting the license. And it seems to me that this could be something that the author of the draft might use from. And one more thing, promised land, half a minute, 30 seconds, yes. But this is really important because I'm not going to discuss the data mining, but perhaps it won't be a great loss because it is the least interesting subject with regards to implementation. So ladies and gentlemen, the directive, the regulation says article 8.2, that you can use the works which are not available in the market if there is no, uh, not a representative institution of collective management. But if you refer to specific uh, um, uh, elements in the directive, you have references to different difficulties. You have references to, for example, the lack of understanding with regards to the conditions of granting a license. So to me, it is too controversial because the lack of consensus might justify it. But there are, there might be situations in which the collective management institution says simply no, and they don't want to grant license. So this is some a uh, clash, divergence between the text of the regulation and the motivation, the practice. So I, I'm really sorry that the author of the draft decided for the one-to-one -one transposition of the contents on the, of the regulation without the possibility of extending the activity sphere of the, uh, of the regulation. I'm really sorry I went on talking too long. I have a tendency to go for hours. So we are hospitable in Krakow, but we didn't want to interrupt, but I would like to also to split my hospitality into even parts and move on to the next speaker. We're all waiting for the statement of a practitioner, an excellent one who is greatly experienced. Director Katarzyna Szlaska, please. Thank you very much for inviting me to this discussion. As uh, Madam has said, uh, my task is to refer to what the previous speakers have said. And I must say with great satisfaction that Mr. Timoteusz Barański uh, has said what very many librarians would say. I know that he is greatly experienced when it comes to collaboration with the library sector, and therefore very many things that have been said by him could be repeated by me. So I'm not going to repeat them, obviously. And I'd like to speak here, uh, talking about two perspectives. I want to talk about copyright as binding in Poland. So the first perspective is the following, whether what we currently have or what is envisaged by the amendment to the copyright uh, act is satisfying for libraries and their users. And the second issue is what uh, you called here low appetite for legal risk, which means this um, concern that there might be some legal complications, a concern that there might be litigation from um, right holders or the collective management organizations. Very often libraries, they don't have the right legal apparatus and they simply panic. So, uh, 
is what the implementation of the DSM directive um, gives us satisfying for libraries in 2023? Well, no. Why? Because the complications mentioned by the previous speaker, namely legal chaos related to the possibility of making works available on terminals or not, uh, reproduction or not, well, it means that we all move to the public domain, namely licenses, non-exclusive, uh, made with uh, economic right holders. And I want to speak here on behalf of academic libraries, which are necessary for teaching, teaching in the academia. Now, scientific publications uh, of very few copies or that are not in a paper form, but only available online. So the possibility to make them available uh, is limited because of the law. Now, the two speakers mentioned here this fair use. I'd love to see this clear definition of a fragment of a text in Poland. What does a short work uh, that can be published without legal consequences means? How short should such a short work be? And what does a fragment mean? We know that the German legislator in the implementation of the DSM directive uh, said it very clearly what percentage of a work uh, meant that it was a fragment of a work and that you can use without any consequences. Now, we also have um, here educational uh, use. So this is something that we have with e-learning, which was so popular during the pandemic, and that is faring well these days too, that this uh, lending or making available uh, should be done by the responsibility of the entity uh, giving this availability. Well, Please show me a library that will be happy to take such a responsibility. No, this risk, um, appetite for risk is very low. So this approach of the legislator will uh, result in what the director of Jagiellonian University has mentioned here at the beginning. So further legislation when it comes to copyright is already several years behind what is currently available on the market and uh, and it's also behind our technological situation in the world. You have mentioned here uh, briefly text and data mining and I'm very happy that you have mentioned it and that probably it will be included in the amendment on the copyright law because one of the tasks of libraries is to prepare materials for a digital um, humanism studies and text and data mining is a huge part of it and so far it could be used only for a public domain works. So I'm very happy that it will be included. However, it will not satisfy our appetite and it will not satisfy the appetite of our users who keep asking us why they can't use it. And also uh, several issues related to this lack of certainty or this low uh, appetite for risk. Ladies and gentlemen, the situation is the following. The majority of libraries, museums, archives, because we can speak here on behalf of the entire uh, sector of uh, public entities, well, there are no clear interpretations of the law. When it comes to uh, license agreements, there are no patterns that could be used by multiple institutions. Every single institution uh, comes up with their own ideas. This leads to frustration, resignation, and not taking action. 
So I believe that if we're thinking about the perspective of coming years, and if there's no sensible and no uh, costly uh, solution that will allow for e-lending, and here we're talking about scanned uh, materials or those that are already in a digital form that have no paper form. Well, if this does not happen, this will be uh, very harmful to libraries and uh, their users, especially for academic libraries and scientific libraries, because we're talking here about publications which uh, have very few copies when it comes to uh, paper form. If we have many libraries where uh, such a copy, uh, such material, such work could be useful, and we have only 70 copies of them, and we cannot increase the number of copies under law, then our situation uh, cannot be envied. Now, the mission of libraries is to provide information, is to give access to information to everyone who needs this information in any form, in any possible form. And I believe that this digital world that we are part of, if there are no more flexible solutions or clearer interpretations of what we are allowed to do and of what we are not allowed to do, well, this will be the world that will leave, lead libraries to a dead end, where we will do less than we could. Well, uh, there is one more topic, however, I don't want to open this Pandora box here. But this topic is very close to my heart, namely archiving the internet and providing access to what isn't available on the internet anymore, but has been archived. But let's leave it uh, for a different discussion. But this topic is perfectly part of what we are discussing here right now. I'm not sure whether the Polish legislator uh, envisages the possibility of the internet being digitized um, by uh, different uh, stakeholders. Uh, thank you to the previous speaker for uh, doing the homework for me. Uh, you've said the majority of the things I wanted to say. Yes, we are at this situation. Um, schizophrenic situation. I'd love libraries and uh, archive people to have this certainty. Uh, I'd love the law to be so clear and the interpretation of the law to be so clear that we can move across this digital world uh, without being afraid of any litigation. Thank you very much. Our time is limited, but still we have a couple of minutes for a discussion. So I encourage you that you uh, ask questions and refer to what the speakers have said. Yes, we have first question. as they were implemented in, in Poland and hopefully paved the way to uh, open culture, are um, intersecting in a complex way or even clashing with other legal provisions that pertain to cultural heritage. And I'm thinking about the um, Museum Act, for instance. So is there any way that there is this kind of uh, clashes as we are seeing, for instance, in, in Italy uh, with reference to Article 14? Any reference, for instance, in the uh, Museum Act in Poland? I'm not sure I'm looking at the most updated version, but I was reading Article 9 with the possibility of doing business for the museum. Is these in any way uh, probably, uh, probably clashing okay. with the idea of opening culture? 
Okay, so maybe I'm, I'm going to take this question, this hit. Uh, as I understand your question, it is about uh, the discrepancies between uh, copyright provisions and uh, uh, acts governing uh, other aspects of uh, uh, GLAM, GLAM. Uh, well, I think uh, it's hard to, to, to think about something like this under uh, current uh, 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 current legislation. However, there was uh, such uh, a problem as you uh, describe because uh, museums uh, which uh, were holding uh, uh, public domain uh, stuff uh, were absolutely sure that uh, they can license uh, the, the reproductions of uh, what they are uh, displaying. And it was, uh, uh, from the copyright perspective, it was, and it is obvious that if something is uh, in the public domain since uh, the copyright expired or even uh, uh, never, never existed, uh, you can exploit it. But uh, there were a few museums, I don't uh, recall uh, which one it was, fortunately, uh, uh, for this institution, which uh, was trying to, to license uh, uh, the reproductions of its, uh, 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 of, of what it was uh, holding. And uh, as I remember, uh, this matter uh, was uh, ultimately judged uh, by the Polish uh, competition court, which fined this uh, institution uh, and uh, decided that uh, ruled that uh, it's absolutely uh, unlawful. Uh, under uh, the current version of the Museum Act, as I remember, there is a provision which stipulates that museums uh, can uh sell the reproductions of uh, the works exhibited but it doesn't mean and never has meant that it can uh, that museums can license uh, uh works which uh, uh, are in the public domain so i'm not sure if i'm it, um, responding to this question correctly but as far as i understand it and maybe I will add that this provision in Museum Act also not give the museums, it's not a kind of exceptional limitation, the new or separate like exceptional limitation. Czy jeszcze mamy pyta Proszę bardzo. Znaczy, jeden taki komentarz uh, z praktyki. Pan Just mówił... one more comment from the world of practice. You spoke how we could reconcile uh, this possibility to supplement collections uh, with this prohibition on increasing the collection. So you can make a copy that will be made available. The original is put in a drawer and then you don't need to buy a new copy if it is used. So maybe that's a solution. May I add? Yes, this is how it is explained in commentaries. Yes, so you put it on a shelf. Maybe it is bizarre, but that's how it's done. Now, uh, I have a question from the point of view of libraries. What's a good uh, legal solution for online catalogs where we have metadata? So usually the photo of a cover and then also the copy of uh, the last pages of the text. Or maybe we have just metadata and the photo of the cover. Okay, let me speak uh, as a practitioner here. Now the issue of covers comes back as a boomerang because libraries, they want to have covers because they're nice and people want to see them. And different entities, that are also part of the glam sector abroad, uh, they also show these covers. But when we have this Anglo-Saxon copyright, um, as opposed to our copyright, well, they have this doctrine which says that even if something could be qualified as reproduction of a uh, graphic work, 
The reception of it isn't the same as the reception of the original. And therefore, we cannot speak about reproduction, reproduction as infringing someone's, uh, the, the author's monopoly. But in Poland, we say the minimis norad pretor. So even if you infringe this author's monopoly, so even the slightest infringement of the monopoly is already an infringement. There's one more thing that I find really bizarre, but it's quite characteristic. Now the property uh, law uh, over the past 200 years, let's say since the Napoleon's code, uh, now moves from monopoly to uh, taking into account public interest to a greater and greater extent. But if we think about the development of intellectual property and especially copyright, then this development tendency is reversed because it all started with this privilege, this natural right or this utilitarian understanding of this privilege uh, given by the state. Now, if we think about the periods of protection in the member states as they were at the beginning and what they are now, then this tendency is that the interest of those who exploit creation is favored as a, at the cost of um, institutions of cultural uh, heritage and other potential users. So we need to be happy with any kind of legislation that uh, is trying to broaden uh, this possibility of use. So yes, the intermediaries, they make money as usual. Let me refer to the first part of your statement. Yes, it is a solution, you know, putting a book on the shelf, but in open access um, of the Warsaw Library, there's half a million of books. If we scan them and we make them available on terminals, then we can close the library. But this is not good to the users because this access is only on terminals while a book can be taken home. So let's not go in this direction that, for example, if you scan a book, you put it on a shelf and you are happy about it because it's a totally different way of using the book. I'd love to be able to have a book and have a digital copy, even if it is only one digital copy. So this would be satisfying for both libraries and users. Are there any other questions? We have one more question from our online uh, participants. Some of them concerned court litigations against libraries. So this perhaps will be make the scale of the problem more realistic and the low appetite for legal risk. So yes. Unfortunately, I will probably not give the satisfactory answer to the question to the person who asks the question. So my experience is the subject of the protection of professional confidentiality of a lawyer, but without getting into that large area, I can tell you that this is a, not a mass scale. However, there are claims, at least in the prejudicial area, lodged by large players, either in media or publishers who even in let's say because you know these institutions of cultural heritage 
follow the legalistic principle and they do not render valuable anything that they are able uh, that they are aware that they are unable to but if they if they do something controversial that might be there are some claims or threats of claims to be lodged so the difference of scale should be also understandable because if this is a large institution of cultural heritage whose budget it is like billions so their reaction to the prejudicial uh, uh, claim which is sent by a legal office with all the expressions and the different and also we have a different in uh, the situation of a minor institution so uh, uh, this happens, but I believe that some civil litigations, at least those that reach the stage in which the court of a higher instance are ruling, there are few and far between. Also, there is a debate uh, between our online users, so they, the practitioners concern the uh, the questions concerning the table of contents and the uh, covers. So when it comes to covers, my author's interpretation is that no, it is not possible because it is both mm, distribution and reproduction. When it comes to tables of contents, there is a regulation in the copyright law which defines that collections are protected if the selection is and the list is creative the table of contents is not creative because it recreates the structure of another work but quoting these in the table of contents specific expression from the contents could be regarded as some partial uh, reproduction there are many Mm, there are many cases in which tables of contents meet the prerequisites of reproduction because these are the data coming from the work who actually prepared the, uh, uh, the, the work on a given, um, the, the processing of a given work, but tables of contents in the definite uh, a uh, part of the cases should be actually not creative but recreated in their character but the discussion is still going on but there are also references to the title of uh, books and metadata so yes the title of a book is not covered by pro, uh, copyright. So yes, the year of publication and the place of publication, let's not go mad. This is not subject of copyright. Ladies and gentlemen, I do appreciate the opinion of the specialist, but uh, I'm speaking from the point of view of a practitioner. Book cover especially in public libraries have a character of an advertisement of promotion attracting the reader so this should be the prerequisite that allows for showing the titles showing the covers especially in the case of books for children i know that the theorists are different but also the rendering available the table of contents may be creative or recreative but this is the moment when a reader decides whether to take the book or not read the book or not so from the point of view of a practitioner in a library well i know that the interpretations are definite but here the regulations should be amended but you should also be aware that both the cover and the table of contents might be works but uh, if they are used to evoke interest among the readers or for um, performing the public mission by the library, it is not the fair use. Uh, 
So I, well, it's very, very sad, yes, but I'm trying to enforce an interpretation that in the part concerning what's new, uh, the liberal understanding of a quote should allow for the use of the covers, but there are no legal grounds for the use of book covers in any catalogs. There are, There is perhaps a space for the contracts with publishers, but this is an immense type of work. If we consider every isolated title, but for example, orphan work. So this is the road to hell to consider every orphan work. So we actually should employ a team of people to orphan the works. The libraries do not have resources for it. But what about the associations that are involved in the work with libraries? Here also there is a debate in Zoom, but we stole a quarter from your lunch break. No, yes, but the hunger must call us. So intellectual appetites do exist, but also mm, physical appetite exists as well. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please collect the lunch vouchers from the reception desk. So the lunch break will take an hour, so we will reconvene at half past one. Thank you.